Good morning, everyone. Welcome to CSIS. Uh, my name is Matthew Goodman. I hold the Simon Chair in Political Economy here at CSIS. Delighted uh, you could join us uh, this morning for this uh, event on economic statecraft. I uh, also want to welcome our online viewers. We have uh, quite a following online. I was in Asia last week and found out that we have a lot of um, uh, a big fan club out there that stays up late into the night to watch our events, so welcome to all of you. Um, I want to thank um, our sponsors, uh, Financial Prom uh, Promontory Financial Group, and uh, other sponsors who prefer to remain anonymous for supporting us in this, uh, in this uh, project. And I also want to thank the uh, advisory group, um, about a um, total of about 20 people um, who are mentioned in uh, the acknowledgments of the report that I hope you got when you came in, uh, who were very helpful in uh, providing us input and advice based on long experience working uh, in economic statecraft, whether at the State Department or at other agencies of the U.S. government. Um, and uh, they were terrific and, and very helpful, and we really appreciate their input. So um, I'll introduce our panelists in just a second, but let me just um, frame this by saying that you know, economic statecraft is a topic that uh, will strike uh, some people, perhaps even some in this room, as a fairly wonkish uh, kind of Washington-like topic. Um, and you know, I understand that, but I think this is a really important issue because you know, e foreign policy is economic policy, as somebody recently said. Um, Secretary Kerry, and uh, you know, countries are amassing economic power and using it in the world, and the United States, uh, still the largest economy in the world, um, plays in that space, and we certainly use our economic power in the world, uh, but we need, to, you know, we need to up our game. We need to sharpen our game in the face of, of these uh, changes in the international economic environment uh, and uh, these new emerging players. And so the way we do economic statecraft is, is really, really important. And uh, we at the Simon Chair are really focused on elevating this conversation about economics and foreign policy. And we intend to do a series uh, of reports on different aspects of this topic. Uh, we decided to start with uh, the premier agency uh, of US foreign policy and the first in the cabinet protocol order, the State Department. Uh, and so this report that you receive, the short 13-page uh, uh, report, is focused on uh, the State Department. But uh, as I say, uh, it gets kind of uh, into the plumbing and the mechanics of the State Department. But, uh, but please bear in mind that this is part of a broader project and a broader focus on a very important set of issues uh, that I think the State Department is a very important uh, element of. And so we, we, um, we um, are very excited to be launching this report today and to have all of you here to have this discussion about what the State Department does well and what it could do better in, uh, in economic statecraft. Um, okay, with no further ado, I'm going to introduce our panel. You have biographical packs, so I'm not going to go into great detail, uh, but to uh, your far left, uh, we have Bob Pollard, who is a State Department visiting fellow uh, in the Europe program here at CSIS. Uh, Bob has long experience as an economic officer uh, at the State Department, and um, you can read about all of his uh, esteemed work in this uh, area in uh, the biographical data. Uh, next to Bob is Greg Hicks, also a State Department visiting uh, fellow here at CSIS in the office of the President. Uh, Greg is also an economic officer at the State Department and has um, actually, between the two of them, they have over half a century of uh, experience working on economic statecraft and other issues at the State Department. So we're delighted to have them both here. They are also the uh, primary authors of this, uh, this report. Um, let me stress that they, are, they wrote this report uh, in their own uh, personal capacities, and the views expressed in here uh, are theirs and not uh, those of the State Department or any other institution. Uh, and then right next to me here is a familiar face here at CSAS, Clay Lowry. Uh, who is Vice President at the uh, Rock Creek Global Advisors uh, Group and uh, also former uh, colleague of mine at the Treasury Department. He was uh, ultimately Assistant Secretary of the Treasury for International Affairs. And Clay is going to give, has uh, many years of experience working uh, in economic statecraft and with the State Department. So he's going to be our discussant today and comment on uh, Bob and Greg's uh, presentation and on the report. So I think with no further ado, unless there was something else I was meant to say at the beginning, uh, please do turn off your phones and set them on stun or 
otherwise uh, <laughs> silence them. Um, and uh, we will uh, go straight to Bob. Thanks. Good morning. Uh, first, I wanted to recognize uh, Carla Hills, our former USTR. Uh, we worked together a long time ago, uh, some 22 years ago, a TIFA in Singapore the first time, and I always found that that, uh, I guess I'd have to say uh, that Ms. Hills was my favorite USTR, so I'm especially <laughs> pleased to see her here. I wanted to say how honored, truly honored I was to serve with the distinguished panel of, ex of experts on this project and to work with Greg Hicks as co-author. And I also especially want to thank Matt Goodman, who's really the, the guru uh, of this project. He acted as an excellent advisor, contributor, and editor, and even sometimes as a judicious referee when that was needed. I'm going to focus on the report's critique of state's performance and the interagency process as it relates to state. First, the panel of experts was united in the conviction that international economic policy is a central part of foreign policy and not a standalone entity. Putting it another way, economic policies should be designed to promote strategic international objectives just as foreign policy is often designed to support commercial interests. What is more, the advisory group agreed that the State Department has a key role in economic diplomacy, but that this function has, been, has suffered a downgrade in recent years. Changing that will require strong and sustained leadership and intervention from the Secretary of State himself, the group concluded. Hence, the experts welcomed the initiatives by Secretaries Clinton and Kerry to revisit the question of state's role in foreign economic policy making. The overall assessment was that despite its many strengths, the State Department is underperforming in the area of economic diplomacy. In particular, observers sharply distinguished between state's performance in the field and its performance in Washington, what we have labeled the American Embassy brand and the Foggy Bottom brand, respectively. First to the American Embassy brand. Overall, state economic officers received high marks for their commercial advocacy, their language aptitude and cultural skills, their timely analysis of economic developments in the host country, and their assessment on how to achieve US national interests. Our advisory group praised state officers for their reach that is to say, their comprehensive contact with the full range of host government officials, business, civil society, universities, and NGOs in over 200 posts abroad. This reach, the report notes, gives state officers an unequaled understanding and feel for the policies in the host nation, for how their interagency functions, and for what buttons to push to get results on economic as well as other U.S. interests. Under the ambassador's leadership, state officers bring a whole of government approach to the country team, integrating political, economic, military, and cultural perspectives into a unified foreign policy. In many places, too, state acts as the eyes and ears of other agencies, such as USTR, Treasury, and commerce that may not be present at post. So there, in brief, is the good news about state's economic function. But I suspect that that's not why most of you are here. You are here to hear the bad news. And I can assure you that the, there's plenty of that in the report, too. And that brings me now to what we call the foggy bottom brand. In general, we heard state is not very effective in the Washington interagency. State often appears more knowledgeable of and even sympathetic to the views of foreign governments than US interests. In other words, 
it is guilty of clientitis, the critics charge. In fact, the regional bureaus at state that dominate policymaking often subordinate economic considerations to things like political, military, and counterterrorism priorities, as well as lesser matters of the moment. Another problem that our panelists noted is that the senior leadership in the department often does not fully engage in the interagency process on economic issues. Further, state economic officers often do not have the same economic expertise as their counterparts in other agencies. As a result, state tends to bring weak economic analysis to interagency meetings. To compound the problem, foreign service officers who, after all, spend the majority of their careers overseas are, not, are often not skillful players in the bureaucratic politics of Washington compared with their more seasoned colleagues at Treasury, USTR, and Commerce. Further, the State Department is divided into so many bureaus and fiefdoms that it can take state a long time to, to coordinate a unified position in interagency meetings and to clear on policy decisions, even relatively minor ones, for reasons that often have to do with more to do with bureaucratic haggling than substantive policy reasons. So our report describes state's failings in great detail. As authors, our duty was to faithfully report what we heard. Even if we did not agree with all of the criticisms, we had to acknowledge that there certainly was some truth to many of them. That said, a number of state officers, past and present, had strong reactions to some of these allegations. Naturally, state officers bristled at the charge of clientitis, arguing that they very well should offer policy guidance based on their insights into a foreign government's motivation and interests. Another common reaction was that no matter what the State Department does to reform the economic function in-house, it will not matter that much unless there are significant changes in the interagency process as well. Now, as it happens, a number of the advisory experts raised the interagency process specifically as it relates to state. Let's start with the NSC's role. Our panelists noticed, noted that the NSC has increasingly sought to concentrate decision-making into its own hands and has become more and more involved in foreign policy operations, rather than delega delegating authority to responsible line agencies like state. Our report did not address whether this was necessarily good or bad but did note that the NSC has not always effectively coordinated and managed the interagency process. The perception among state officers, for example, is that USTR, and especially Treasury, often tend to hoard information, protect turf, and to keep state and the rest of the foreign policy apparatus in the dark on what they're doing. Now, this perhaps would not matter if this tendency to go it alone invariably led to optimal policy choices. But several of our advisors believe that this was not the case and that, the, that this is something the NSC needs to fix. And to be clear, it's not just Treasury and USTR. Many US agencies, including the NSC, communicate directly with counterparts in foreign governments without informing and engaging the help of the embassy sometimes not even the ambassador, who is, after all, the president's personal represent representative. So does it really matter? Yes, the report points out, because it means that much of the value of what we have called the American embassy brand is often squandered. And it means that state can't do its job well in Washington as well. Policy making can be improved, for example, when state is able to bring its expertise fully to bear on what makes a foreign government tick 
and how that country is likely to react to US policy initiatives. From a managerial point of view alone, this needs to be remedied. So in conclusion, this report says that improving the State Department's economic function will require significant changes both within state and in the interagency process. Now over to Greg, and thank you very much for your kind attention. Good morning, thank you for coming. And thank you, Bob, for a terrific first half of our presentation. Uh, before continuing, I too would like to thank Matt Goodman for his leadership on a key issue for the success of our country in the 21st century. For those of us who have had the privilege of working with Matt pre previously, his leadership and his passion for international economics are both expected and appreciated. Likewise, I join Bob in thanking our advisory panel participants for their contributions to the product. We could not have completed the paper without their wise counsel. And so on to the second half. No, oh, sorry, no whistles. <laughs> Before dis discussing the report's recommendations, we thought it would be useful to talk a little bit about how we looked at the problem. And in this regard, I would like to especially thank CSIS Shoal Chair Scott Miller for his insights, which led us to expand our horizons and view state's role in crafting economic policy also from the perspective of private business. Having identified state's strengths and weaknesses, we asked some fundamental questions. What does state need to do to improve its brand? And how can state capitalize on its comparative advantages to improve the quality of its products and services? Our panel of experts all stressed the importance of leadership at state. Both Secretary Kerry and former Secretary Clinton have emphasized that the international economy had to factor more importantly in our foreign policy. Former Secretary Clinton's Economic Statecraft Initiative revitalized embassy support for American businesses, and she led by example, advocating on behalf of Boeing and other American companies on numerous occasions. On the policy side, she strengthened our economic diplomacy with China through co-leadership of the Strategic and Economic Dialogue, and with the EU, EU in efforts to san toughen sanctions on Iran. For his part, Secretary Kerry's first, first speech at the University of Virginia in February 2013 clearly indicated his desire that economic policy figure more prominently in state's foreign policy toolkit. And his team is working hard to broaden Clinton's economic statecraft initiative. But world events requiring the intervention of the Secretary of State have a habit of constantly demanding personal attention. So our experts also stressed the importance of leadership from the Undersecretary for Economic Growth, Energy, and the Environment, or E, in state's internal vernacular. The person in this position who sits within the state who sits within the state bureaucracy at a level that can convene every State Department actor involved in economic policy must have clear authority from the Secretary to coordinate foreign economic policy work within state, to craft unified state views, and to represent them to the interagency. E must also have the ability to delegate this authority to other appropriate state officials as necessary. Of equal importance, as several of our, of our advisors observed, U.S. international economic policy has been at its best when E and the Deputy National Security Advisor for International Economics have had a close working relationship. State performed best, several individuals mentioned, when the Deputy National Security Advisor for International Economics regularly convened top-level meetings that brought the Economic Undersecretary together with senior counterparts from the other major economic agencies. At the working level, our panel consistently praised 
state's past exercise of convening authority to bring representatives from all relevant agencies to the table and to find integrated policy solutions to international economic challenges. This practice has much merit. And thus, we recommend that the NSC designate appropriate regional economic deputy assistant secretaries to chair standing interagency policy committees on foreign and economic policy integration. The report underscored the importance of US ambassadors to the successful crafting and implementation of foreign economic policy, both in advocating for US businesses and in coordinating whole of government policy interventions with foreign governments. Good ambassadors don't learn these skills in their sleep. They are acquired through working with interagency colleagues over many years and from actually leading interagency discussions to sensible policy conclusions. A thorough background in economic and commercial policy is also important. We strongly recommend upgrading economic and commercial policy training for newly appointed ambassadors. Organizationally, our group reached the conclusion that capitalizing on states' international reach requires more effective economic policy work from states' regional bureaus, which provide primary connectivity to our overseas posts. Thus, we strongly recommend that each regional bureau appoint a career foreign service economic officer to a deputy, secretary, deputy assistant secretary position give primary responsibility for the Bureau's economic policy work to that person, and stand up a regional economic policy office to support the Bureau's economic work. State's Bureau for Western Hemisphere Affairs served as our primary example for this recommendation. Within the Economic Bureau, we recommend that at least half of its deputy assistant secretaries should be career foreign service economic officers. And in response to views coming from the business community, we believe that state's coordinator from, for business affairs should also be a career economic officer, and that the position should be designated as state's main point of contact for commercial services and support. As important, we recommended changes within the state personnel system that would improve recruitment, training, and incentives for state's foreign service economic officers. In conclusion, most of us here grew up in a world that has been largely described as bipolar. Today's world is multipolar. It is more complex and more competitive than, that any, than any America has previously experienced. At the same time, the US economy is more connected to the global economy and therefore more dependent on it than ever before. Our competitors and strategic allies alike, Brazil, China, the European Union, Japan, India, and Russia, are seeking to amass economic power and to deploy it as a leading element of their foreign policies. In many cases, they are seeking strategic, strategic advantages through these efforts, often at the expense of American interests. Russia's diplomacy in support of its Ukraine policy is a perfect example. America's success in the 21st century will depend on our economy's ability to remain globally competitive. This will require the US government to identify and to implement the right foreign economic policies. The State Department has a central role in that effort. We believe the recommendations in this paper, if adopted, can enhance the State Department's effectiveness and America's ability to compete globally. Thank you. Great. You want to stay there or you want to go? You're out there. You're out there. Okay, hold on. Hold it. David? Okay, you're going to sit there, Clay? Okay, good. All right, go ahead. Uh, first of all, thank you all for having me here, and uh, thanks to Gray and Bob for their excellent report. Um, so I served for about 16 years under the Treasury Department um, in the international economic uh, policy making space primarily which means actually it means probably that I did about a year and a half of 
you know, going to meetings, writing, uh, doing some analysis, writing a memo every now and then, and trying to actually think about what I could do to help the taxpayer. I, and then I did about 14 years of bitching about the State Department <laughs> <laughs> and, and six months of fighting with USTR. <laughs> um, so that was kind of my take on the whole thing. And um, uh, when Secretary Clinton gave her speech in 2011 on the importance of economic statecraft, I actually did talk to people at Treasury about it. And they wanted to know my views, uh, just as somebody who had been around for a while. And I said I thought it was an excellent speech and an excellent presentation if they were serious about this. And one reaction I got from some was, you mean even the chief economist role over at state? And I'm like, well, I don't really care how state actually does their bureaucratic fixes. And yeah, it would be great for state to have a chief economist, was my view. Um, and not because, look, I, I actually get that Treasury is a turfy place, but is because State Department uh, is our foreign policy voice in, in the world. It is our day-to-day -day face around the world. And economics and finance and trade and investment issues are, one, very complicated, and two, are most of the time very predominant and very important to how we think about our foreign policy. Um, I can, in Secretary Bob Rubin's book um, that he did about his time when he was at the Treasury Department, he talks about the importance of the ambassador in Korea. Understanding, not being an expert on, but understanding the importance of a balance of payments. Understanding what, a, what is a banking system, how does it really work and function. Not because he's ever gonna understand anything to the degree that Bob Rubin, who had been 25 years or whatever it was at, at, on Wall Street would understand it, but because he could have a communications. It gave a Secretary of Treasury a lot more um, the confidence that what he was saying to the Koreans and what he was saying within the government was being understood across the US government. And that actually, just underscores kind of the importance that people at Treasury, at least, I think of as figure out that state can help with. Let's take today's world right now. All right, Secretary of State uh, uh, Madeleine Albright just said the other day, it seems like we got, got a bit of a mess out there. Um, that's an understatement. Um, so what are those messes? Let's take two that are most prominent. One is what is happening in, uh, between Israel and Hamas. Okay, so um, we know that there is decades of history and political tensions and so forth that are going on there. And there are specific matches that struck the fire that has kind of gone, uh, happened. But the core issue in many respects is an economic problem. And the economic problem is Hamas, one, bad policies, two, um, their, some of their routes are, have been cut off from Egypt and in Israel for a variety of reasons, and I'm not getting into what happened, but it has created a big problem. And so then, what is the solution to that problem? Fire rockets at each other. Um, and so that, um, understanding the macroeconomic trade and investment issues behind what is happening there is key to understanding how to fix it. That's something that State Department needs to know and must have experience in. In, in the Russia-Ukraine example that's going on right now, largely I think that the problems are what's happening are not economic. However, what are the tools and solutions that are being thought of are almost primarily economic. How do we get sanctions that actually bite on the Russians so they could stop this behavior? How do we work with the EU, which has lots of economic ties and market ties to Russia to basically do some of the steps that we would like them to take, which are very difficult for them to take? These are primary issues about trying to understand the importance of capital flows, the importance of where do sanctions actually bite and work, and that is something that, yes, Treasury Department's gonna be very helpful on, and the Commerce Department can be very helpful on, but the State Department actually is probably the key agency. So I had three points to make. Um, my first point was the one that I've been making, I think, which is the importance that economics and, and finance and trade and investment have in our foreign policy setting. 
and why we need to have State Department officials and frankly even uh, other government agency officials more, in, uh, more knowledgeable on. In fact, the only reason I ever, I did some teaching at Georgetown University and I taught foreign service students, I didn't teach economics, I taught foreign service students, was because when I was at NSC, um, sometimes I sat in meetings with people who were way smarter than me, and certainly way smarter than me on foreign policy issues, whether they were at the Defense Department or the State Department or maybe the, uh, one of the intelligence agencies, and their knowledge sometimes of finance and economics was actually not very good. They thought of the IMF as a giant ATM machine. And, um, <laughs> and, I, and that's not what the IMF does. And so how do you try to, and so that was my view, is like, I never thought about teaching my life because I didn't think I, I would be any good at it, but I just thought, um, and I didn't think I had enough knowledge to teach anybody anything, but I thought this was something I could help some people with who have a, deep interest in foreign policy, but are scared of numbers. And so let's try to figure out how do you not be scared of numbers? That doesn't mean you have to do econometrics like a Nobel Prize winner. It means you have to basically not be scared of numbers. Um, my second point I wanted to make, because uh, and uh, it got brought up a little bit by Bob's presentation, is um, primarily I have a very good experience with the State Department on economic issues. I mean, yeah, Treasury and State fight all the time, but I mean, uh, but that's a different, that's sometimes just a, just a different perspective on how, how to look at the world. I think that if I had a criticism, it would be tell State, look, don't try to do everything. Um, and, um, but, you know, I remember I used to go in 1999 every month to Paris. I mean, that's not such a bad thing, I guess. Every month to Paris, <laughs> to do Paris Club negotiations with my State Department colleague. I mean, we literally held hands, we practically slept in the same bed. I mean, we went and just went together and did everything together, and it was vital for us to be on the same page because we were negotiating on behalf of the United States of America. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so I had great experiences with that. I remember back in 2008, we're in the middle of the worst financial crisis you can possibly imagine in this country. And so Treasury Department uh, individuals were a little busy. Um, and um, the country of Pakistan was clearly getting, in, had gotten into financial trouble. And it was, it was actually, and this is, uh, I'm patting the back of my colleagues, not myself, at Treasury, who were the first people to really pick up on this and figure out that this was a true balance of payments crisis that was going to happen. The IMF was actually slow on this one. And um, we worked that issue very hard. At first, many of the State Department people had probably a little of the clientitis. No, this is Pakistan. We got lots of important issues. And our point was, it's, maybe we do have important issues, but they're going down. And they're going down if we don't fix these problems. And then once the State Department people had heard the analysis, thought about it, and that's not the analysis they should be doing. It's an analysis Treasury should be doing. They came on board and were so helpful at trying to figure out what is Saudi Arabia really thinking about these issues? How do we, what are the Pakistans really thinking about this? Why is this problem happening? And um, we worked that instead of basically saying, let's just write a check to the Pakistanis, which I promise you that conversation happened, um, it was much more um, uh, how do we get them to take steps to fix the whole? or stop the hole from filling up. And then we can help fill, uh, fill up the gap through financial issues. Um, I just saw Kurt Tong walk in. I recall the US-Korea free trade agreement negotiations. I was in the middle of dealing with a very tricky issue on investment um, and, and currency type of issues. Um, I, it was knowledge of people from State Department and USTR that helped me in my role as the Treasury Department official to actually do a very, what I thought was a great job, not because of me, but because of the overall team effort on getting a very good free trade agreement, which I think will be in the interest of the United States in the long run. Are there negative experiences? Of course there are. Um, I recall one time a, neg uh, a negotiation in which, um, with one of the multilateral development institutions, in which a State Department official, we were taking a very tough line at Treasury, which is almost like an oxymoron, but we were taking a very tough line um, in the negotiation, and the State Department official 
literally was blurting out our instructions practically to, to another delegation um, because they didn't think that we were playing the diplomacy correctly. That obviously is not called for. Mm -hmm. And so, um, but those were the rare exceptions. And, um, um, and I thought that the main thing that state needed to do was keep getting better at the economic issues not because the, I wanted them to become the Treasury Department or the USTR or the Commerce Department, but because I wanted them because I knew of all their reach that they had. So I guess my point three is to go to the, go to the recommendations in the report. And let me just say for the record, uh, this is a tough report to write. Greg and Bob are, have over 50 years of experience in the economic cone within the State Department, and there's a lot of criticisms in, in there about the economic cone of the State Department. They deserve a lot of credit for being able to look at the mirror. Um, I think in the end, if Secretary Kerry can come forward and do some of the things that Secretary Clinton was trying to do, and by the way, uh, past secretaries have done as well, I thought that what was great about Secretary Clinton was she put such an emphasis and a highlight to it. Um, is there's two things that you have to try to feel, deal with uh, to make the, all these recommendations work, and most of them are built around it. One is very difficult, and uh, one is, one's very difficult and almost impossible to figure out how to correct. The other is difficult and impossible to figure out how to correct. The first is the point that I think both uh, Greg and Bob have made, which is leadership and personalities. I, I was at NSC when we had personality difficulties between NSC, Treasury, State, USTR, Commerce. And I was also there, I was at Treasury when we had an absolutely great working relationship between all of those agencies um, where, yeah, we had had policy disagreements, but no real bad turf fights, and I thought things flowed and worked well. And the leadership then, of course, comes from the top, but it comes from these, uh, the uh, senior management as well. I don't know how you fix that. I mean, it just has a issue of they have to believe in management issues. By the way, people in this town are terrible managers, and um, and they all think about it's really important. We got to do a good job at it, and most of them are terrible at it. And so, and it's not because that it's because they've been great at policy making. And so, how do you do a good job of management? And that's not an easy thing. And I don't know how to fix that. And how do you get the leadership and the personalities? The second issue is, and this is where I guess being an economist, it is all about incentives. How do you get the incentives correct? And I think there's a number of uh, points in here about having regional assistant secretaries, for instance, um, being graded on how they deal with economic issues. I think that's actually a really good, a good idea. It doesn't mean they won't get overwhelmed. I mean, the assistant secretary for the Middle East, or, um, or, I'm not sure that's what it's called anymore, Near East maybe is, um, has kind of a, has been dealt a fairly tough hand, I would say. Um, and um, as, but, but by the way, economics is gonna be part of that solution. I hope that they damn well are, are thinking about that. Um, um, uh, oh, I swore. <laughs> uh, man, <laughs> you I'm sorry you about that. And then, um, <laughs> um, and, um, but um, getting the incentives rights means you probably are gonna to have to think about the Foreign Policy Institute, or is, the training, is the training correct? I promise you, one of the biggest problems that State Department has is, look, economic cone people sometimes are second class citizens. Both externally, they're not the financial experts, that's Treasury. They're not the trade experts, that's USTR. They're not the uh, commercial diplomacy experts necessarily, although I think that that's a little bit different, that's Commerce Department. They're not the agricultural experts, they're agriculture. So they're kind of playing second fiddle in all these different areas, but that doesn't mean it's not important. And then they sometimes play the second fiddle internally. Who becomes ambassadors of the State Department? That's a huge goal within the Foreign Service. The people that come through the regional departments primarily. Um, and that is a big problem. Why is it that the minister counselor in a very, very serious country in which we have huge, huge issues, whether it's the EU or Germany, Japan, what have you, China, um, is less qualified to be an ambassador than the DCM for some country that nobody in the United States has ever heard of before. That doesn't mean that it's not an important position, but that, um, 
But the way, and sometimes it feels like from the outside that the State Department bureaucracy works, is that DCM person, because they came up through the regional bureau in a very small country, should be an ambassador before the person who's minister counselor of a portfolio that no one human being could actually handle. Um, and so I think if the State Department can figure out how they can get those incentives right to make it a great career at, uh, to be in the Economic Bureau, um, that will help on a lot of things. And that's about bureau bureaucratic changes and about some substantive changes. And I talked on too long. And thank you for having me. Thanks, Clay. OK. Um, first of all, I was remiss at the beginning in not recognizing the Shoal Chair and Scott Miller for their contribution to this report. And I really appreciate it, Scott. Um, also, nice to see a lot of um, current and former um, FSOs and econ officers and, and old friends. So delighted to see all of you. Um, I, we only have a, about 15 minutes until Undersecretary Novelli is going to join us. So I'm going to forego my uh, burning desire to ask you guys a bunch <laughs> of questions and let the audience ask questions. Let me just say three or four points just really quickly to sum up this conversation and the way I look at this. Um, first of all, economic statecraft is a two-sided coin, um, as Secretary Clinton said. It's about using diplomacy to advance U.S. economic interests. And it's about, on the other hand, using economics to inform and improve and advance our foreign policy objectives. To me, the first is kind of is obvious and important, but the second is the one where the money is. I mean, that's the one that is really hard and requires uh, a lot of thought and effort and engagement. And so I, I hope that's the, the focus, is how we use economics strategically to support our foreign policy objectives. That's point one. Point two. Um, the State Department has a comparative advantage in this area, which it, despite all the challenges and problems and, and difficulties it has of, of following and being second fiddle to others and all the internal mechanisms and problems, it has reach. We talk about that in the report. Um, State Department uniquely has reach in the sense that it's in every country in the world and it's in, it can go across countries, across government and across society to deliver messages, to pick up intelligence and insight. And, uh, and that's, I think, what the essence of the answer is, is finding out how to deploy uh, and use a a State Department's reach in a better way. Um, at the same time, a third point is that I think the State Department has to acknowledge that the world has changed. And not only because they no longer have a monopoly on communication in, in the world, I think that's obvious. But to me, the more interesting point is that um, there's no such thing as a domestic agency anymore. I mean, the, as we say in the report, the Department of Health and Human Services is an international agency. Uh, it, to fulfill its domestic mandate of protecting the health of Americans, it has to be in the international space. And the State Department has to uh, figure out how to uh, work with other agencies and accommodate, uh, accommodate that uh, reality. Um, and the final point I'll make is just to emphasize something uh, Clay said, which is it's all about incentives. And, and I think the, the answer is, how do you incentivize? When I was Treasury Attaché in Tokyo, let me tell you, I was heavily incentivized to be a team player with the State Department because my ambassador, Walter Mondale at the time, uh, would write to Larry Summers and tell him Matt's doing a terrible job or a great job. <laughs> and believe me, that made me uh, play as a team player. So it's all about incentives. The reverse, you know, for State Department people, you got to figure out how to get people to, uh, to do this stuff well and to be rewarded for it. And I think that's what it boils down to. Okay, I've said more than I need to say. Let's take questions uh, for the, unfortunately, only 10 minutes we have left. Uh, please um, wait for the microphone, identify yourself, and please do try to ask a quick question. Uh, thank you. It's uh, Dana Marshall with Transnational Strategy Group. Thank you for this. I'm sure that I represent a lot of the Econ Co and FSOs in this room when I say how much we appreciate what you've done with this. A couple of questions on one comment. One question is, there, there's, this report, as important as it is, is written a bit in a vacuum because there is also a need, although the President has said he would do it, frankly he's not done very much, on helping to enhance, <clears throat> pardon me, the um, uh, trade promotion function of the U.S. government. As we remember a few State of the Union speeches ago, there was a big announcement along those lines. As far as I can tell, very little has happened. So one question is, how do you see all that you've written in the context of a reorganization of the trade promotion function across agencies? 
and the second point is although i agree with the recommendations and i've just now looked at them one point that i would quibble about now having you know been in the government state and a number of other economic agencies for a long time and now running my own business with my own private sector clients is the uh, commercial promotion official of the State Department. I think that person is called the Special Representative for Business. You suggest should not be should be a career FSO. Uh, having been one myself, I don't know if that's really what we need in that role. I think what we really need in that role is somebody that knows how the hell to compete from having run a business really run a business, not something that is theoretical. I think a lot of the other recommendations are spot on. On that one, I'd rather see a business person who really knows how to compete okay. uh, in that job. Got it, thanks. Okay, Thank so just on that second one, Greg, uh, maybe you and Bob could take a shot at that. And then on the first one, TPA, really important substantive issue. Um, if anybody wants to answer quickly about that in sort of State Department organizational terms, please do. We're, we're, we've got many other opportunities to have discussions about TPA as a substantive matter, but with regard to State. Uh, on the commercial representative, we talked about this at length. Uh, no ideal solution. Take your point very, very well. It's good to have somebody with business background. But in practice, and we're not naming names, but in practice, uh, this has usually been a political appointee who does or does not have that background, has, does or, often has no government experience. And what we were thinking about is the fact that, particularly in the economic function in state, in EB, of which that job is a part, you often don't have people who have some experience abroad who understand how foreign policy making is made. We don't have the foreign experts, and this person would be a bridge who could do both jobs. So that's where we came out on that. Uh, you want to add anything about it, Greg? Yeah, I think it's important that this job is state's interface with the business community here, but it, it's also responsible for providing or managing the provision of commercial services to American businesses at approximately 100 or over 100 posts overseas. The commercial promotion function that you talked about is actually divided within the United States government overseas between the Foreign Commercial Service in about 55 to 60 embassies overseas or posts overseas, and the rest are, are, are managed by the State Department. And so the, the, the Special uh, Representative for Business Affairs, the Coordinator for Business Affairs, has two functions, and we felt that having that international experience, as Bob said, is more important than, than the business experience. Anybody want to talk about TPA? Again, we will have and have had many opportunities to talk about TPA and encourage a more robust debate about that, Clay. No? Okay. Uh, uh, Sean. Thanks. I'm Sean. Uh, hold, on, hold on one second, Sean, because the people watching online can't hear you unless you have the microphone. Thank Thanks. you, Matt. I'm Sean Donnelly, retired State Department economic officer, now work at the U.S. Council for International Business. On reading the report today, I, I commend Bob and Greg for the the effort and, and certainly all the recommendations make sense to me. Some of them have been around for a while and haven't uh, carried the day, but, but uh, anyway. I just wanted to ask, some people talk of commercial diplomacy, some talk of economic statecraft. Could you just clarify, is there a difference between the two? Is economic statecraft subsume commercial diplomacy and, and be just include both commercial advocacy and policy? I just want to make sure the terminology is straight. Well, I'll let these guys answer, but as I said, I think to me, commercial diplomacy is half, is one side of the coin. It's using yeah. diplomacy to promote U.S. economic and commercial interests. But I think the other side of the coin needs to be talked about and emphasized, which is using economics to inform, support, advance our foreign policy objectives. That's the tough part. That's why we have George Marshall on the cover. It's a little cliched, but I mean, that's what we're trying to emphasize here is that you know, that's what we did in, in the, in the post-war period, is we used our economic power to, to uh, address a serious foreign policy challenge in a creative uh, and effective way. And so that's my answer, but you guys want to take that on? Just real quickly, uh, first of all, Sean was my ex-boss, so I want to point out... Uh, I'm sure, there are a lot of ex-bosses so, uh, <laughs> and uh, subordinates in here. I can see several of them. I'm coming. Uh, uh, I, I, I see commercial diplomacy as being a subset of the larger economic statecraft. There's other uh, macroeconomic and development imperatives, some of which Clay mentioned, which are uh, part of the broader economic uh, statecraft set. 
Okay. All right. Anybody who hasn't been an econ FSO, uh, and, and is, are there any in the room? Yes, sir. Hi, uh, Jonathan Sentis, Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Um, thank you, first of all, for taking some time to, to think about this question of economic statecraft. It's definitely something that we at the committee are interested in and spend a lot of time um, on as well. So I, I noticed in your recommendations you didn't really address the question of funding directly. And so, um, you know, thinking broadly in two ways, one, funding for the State Department itself in terms of improving training, deploying more economic officers, you know, adjusting the incentive packages. And then also the funding for all the related agencies that, you know, help us uh, achieve our economic policy objectives. So things like Exim, you know, USTR negotiating trade deals on a relatively thin travel budget, and, you know, even, even stuff like our contributions to the IMF and, and the multilateral development banks. So just wondering if you had any thoughts on that. First of all, do you have friends on the Appropriations Committee? Because I'm sure that you guys would, <laughs> would welcome uh, support. Uh, Clay, do you want to talk about? Because uh, XM and IMF are particularly Yeah, no, no. I, look, the, those are time. great questions. Um, obviously, I mean, you know, I, I helped a little on the report, but I just helped provide some thoughts. But I mean, um, I think that um, I think the resource question is an important question, which is it get, there's two types of resources, right? There is their operational resource, resources, administrative resources, and there's pro, programmatic ones. And so the XM Bank and IMF and so forth are programmatic ones. Um, uh, it comes in a context of you have declining budgets. The 150 account, which I think most of these things fall under, um, is not usually considered the most popular account there probably is. Um, and, um, uh, but I think the debate on XM Bank is a little bit of money, but it's a lot of bit about what is the policy and what is, are we doing the right thing by uh, doing this? And obviously we don't have the time to go into that debate right now. The IMF, I can't really tell. I think it's largely a political debate um, uh, in which I think most people are like, yeah, we should probably support the IMF, but I want something for it. And so um, uh, um, so I think it was tough for us to get, uh, I mean, these guys can talk about the report, but I think it was tough to get into those type of issues. But I think they're very important. And if you don't have good programmatic budgets and sound uh, and sound priorities, then a lot of this all falls away. Um, but um, to be frank, I don't think the administration, and by the way, this is not the Obama administration, Bush administration too, is necessarily all that great at figuring out what exactly its priorities are on these types of issues. Um, I, I view that, you know, maybe you might actually want to cut some things out, and I don't see anybody ever doing that. So. Just quickly. Um, there's always a lot of grousing about Congress and the State Department, but you know, if you look at our report, actually, uh, we do point out that uh, congressional uh, intervention has sometimes been very beneficial. I think the one area on the budget uh, that I think it's, it's hurt us is the off-on aspect. There's been, there was a point in the 90s where our budgets were slashed so deeply that we were cutting, a, we were closing a lot of posts and we were suddenly weren't bringing in new foreign service officers, and to this day, it's like a snake where you have this something, <laughs> you have this big bulge in the middle. You have all these people who are recruited under Colin Powell later on. And uh, you know, it, it made it difficult to, to do our jobs. And um, so I think, I think it's not just the level of the funding, but it's, it's I guess, uh, to allow a little more flexibility, particularly on the personnel side. And I think that just to add that, this caused us to, the, the variability of the budget causes just simply to exclude it and say, what can we do about policy? And then you know, let, let people interface with Congress, perhaps in a more coordinated fashion across all of these agencies to, uh, to work on budgeting. Um, uh, not in this context, but for, for sins in a previous life, I was uh, involved in the QDDR uh, exercise at the State Department, the Quadrennial uh, Diplomacy and Development Review, the first time around when Secretary Clinton launched it. And one of the many recommendations that uh, I left behind was that the State Department needs to do a better job of working the Hill. Uh, they, you know, compared to the DOD, which has, you know, professional lobbyists on both sides of the House, you know, working all the, the relevant committees, State has a couple of people in Foggy Bottom who go up there 
and uh, you know they're they're very uh, dedicated people, but they're not sitting up there on the hill really working the system. And I think um, state, I would we didn't put that in here, but I think that's another thing state ought to uh, focus on is its congressional relations. Um, okay, I've got good news and bad news about Undersecretary Novelli. She's running a little bit late. Uh, the good news is she's running late because she's meeting with Secretary Kerry talking about economic statecraft. So I think we have another, <laughs> so we have another, uh, another, is she arrived? On her way, okay. So we have a few more minutes and then we'll take a quick coffee break. Uh, other questions? Uh, yes, ma'am, Nicole. Hi, I'm Nicole Golden. I've been leading the youth initiative here at CSIS as part of the Project on Prosperity and Development. And um, really interesting conversation. I was formerly at State Department in USAID, and I'm a development economist. And you alluded to it briefly, but most of the conversation, and from what I could see quickly in the report, is about the business and the trade side. So I'm just curious if, through the study, to what extent sort of development economics, working with USAID came into it, whether it's inequality issues, institutional economics, youth employment, so on and so forth. Yeah, it's a good point. We, we um, actually, others have pointed out we didn't cover everything, and one of the things we didn't really go into in depth is development, and we'd like to focus on that in a, in a future um, uh, report. So, uh, good question. You guys want to take on development? Or Clay? Yeah, it, really important subject. Uh, both Bob and I, our experience has been largely in the trade, business, and finance area, and so we, and we thought that. Also, aid and, and state have a very long history of very good relations of working together very closely, especially in the field. And so we, we really th thought that these, these were the issues we wanted to focus on. Um, I guess my view on that is I think it is a very important issue. Um, I think some of the parts in here uh, get into it a little bit in a, in a different type of way, which is that uh, I mean, one, development and economics, um, there is ha the policymaking apparatus within the U.S. government, and then there's the operational apparatus. So the operational apparatus is largely USAID, the Millennium Challenge Corporation, OPIC, um, whereas the policymaking is usually being made at state, a little bit AID, um, a, um, Treasury Department for the multilateral development institutions, and trying to get those to work together actually in some respects can be as hard or more difficult even than th that are done on the macroeconomic finance trade and investment. So I actually think you're right and given that if I understand from Matt correctly, uh, there's gonna be a little bit more done in the future. This is probably something that I think does need to be addressed even more so than is in the current report though I think that the recommendations about how State Department needs to think about these things internally um, and having economic uh, parts in even in the regional areas, all of that I think will go right towards development because development economics is vital whether it's in South Asia or Africa um, or Latin America or even Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union. So. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. We'll take a break after that. Yes, sir. Hi, I'm Mark Kent with the British Embassy here in Washington. I'm, uh, I'm also a sort of economic uh, official by, uh, by uh, sort of training in the UK Foreign Office. Uh, so some of the themes that you've discussed are very familiar to us as well, and we, uh, we share similar challenges. Um, one of the ones that you've, uh, you've touched on, I think only briefly, is if there are anything that the State Department should be doing less of. So in the field of, uh, of economic statecraft, we certainly are thinking about what, how we prioritize, what metrics we use, how we define what we should and should not do. And I wonder, I've heard some recommendations about what more state should do. I wonder if you focus on what it should do less of. Good, good oh, question. Great question. Yeah. Gentlemen, you want to take that on? Well, certainly um, we do far, we, we, we don't do economic analysis like we used to. That's so long, long ago we decided that there's no point trying to compete with Citibank or Treasury for that matter. Um, we, we, of course, would like to do fewer required reports, and that gets back to the Congress, quite frankly. Uh, I think we like to spend less time on that. Uh, Greg, do you want to pick up some other ideas? I said you looked at it the other way, you know, so. I think it's a great question. Um, if you look at the report, it's not necessarily about doing more. Um, 
there is there's a fair amount of uh, recommendations about changing around, as I said, the incentives and some of the bureaucraties, which is really not about doing things more, um, and about doing a little bit deeper training for either existing staff or staff that you start bringing up through the system on the world is changing and you need, and by the way, it shouldn't, I mean, we focus a lot on the economic bureau. It's not really just the economic bureau. You need the regional bureau to have enough economic knowledge. So frankly, they're not, they're not dummies on, that, on these issues. And, um, and so I think that that's where, but I, your point is well taken because one of the key points, my view, on prioritization is figuring out what you can cut. And that is always a tricky issue, as we know, in, in the government. I mean, frankly, and frankly, by the way, it's also in the private sector, too. But it is, um, how do you do a little bit less on a few things because of the uh, set foreign relations uh, 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 staff uh, gentleman's question about resource allocation? And so, um, uh, so I think it's a great question, and maybe we need to think about it a little bit more as we go forward. All right. Bob has another. Well, I had a chance to thank. Thank you, Clay. Uh, that I just I filibustered. <laughs> I think, <laughs> thanks a lot. I think we should do we should do less on country by country analysis, particularly in the field. I mean, what, what's the point? I mean, I, I think we spend uh, people in the field tend to get totally focused on their host country and think more regionally and multilaterally. Uh, for example, in Europe, uh, it, it doesn't make sense to have uh, four economic officers working on uh, just talking about the Swiss economy or or the French economy, but rather to think about the EU, that would be a clear case. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I have an answer. I have a partial answer. I, I think that, um, you know, I think that the state tends to, Clay, Clay alluded to this, ha have uh, this, this role of supporting other agencies and, and, and there's a, and without a lead in most areas. And, and that tends to, I think, have, and I don't want to, you know, single out any particular functions, but there are, you know, there are a lot of people at state who are, are going to meetings to kind of keep an eye on, and I think we do allude to that in the report, to, to follow what other agencies are doing, whether it's a team, a big team going to USTR or to Treasury or wherever, and, and um, sort of uh, uh, following that, that work. I think it would be better, and you could maybe find some efficiencies, if a State Department uh, officer was knowledgeable about um, a broad range of economic issues with respect to a particular country or region, and so could go to a meeting on trade or on finance and with respect to a particular country, um, uh, you know, Indonesia or something, and, and be completely con uh, conversant in all the dimensions of economics and the political and security issues in that, uh, that country. Uh, and bring that to uh, any particular interagency discussion of uh, issues that touch on Indonesia. That I think would be uh, a use, a good use of uh, states' comparative advantage. And I think you'd end up having fewer people necessarily, uh, you know, just going to a whole bunch of uh, USTR-led meetings or something. Uh, again, mm -hmm. and not, you know, so that's that's one possible area of efficiency. I think. Okay, uh, we're going to take a coffee break um, and uh, for like five minutes, I hope, uh, and then uh, Secret Under Secretary Novelli will be with us, and uh, hope you can stay and uh, listen to her, uh, my interview with her, because it'll be that format. So uh, thank you for uh, coming to the first hour, and thank our panelists, please. <laughs>